Hello and welcome. Um, in this review of the lymphatic system, we will be able to appreciate and understand um, the functions of the lymphatic system, how does the lymph form, the composition of the lymph, and how does it return to the bloodstream. We will also be able to understand the different types of the lymphatic tissue, and we will understand the structure and the function of um, the the thymus, um, the lymph nodes, tonsils, and spleen. Uh, what happens when things go wrong, as we always do in our chapters? So if we begin by describing um, the lymphatic system, it's composed of three parts. Network of lymphatic vessels, and those we will call the lymphatics, and lymph, that's the liquid, the solution that is circulating in those uh, vessels. Then we have the lymph nodes. We'll talk about each of those independently in this chapter review. Uh, the function of the lymphatic system, why do we have it? Um, we have it for what we call fluid recovery, immunity, and lipid absorption. Let's start with the fluid recovery. Uh, the fluid, as we know, it continuous, continually filters uh, from the blood capillaries into the tissues. That's because of the hydrostatic pressure that's inside your capillaries. Those capillaries will absorb about 80% or 85% of the liquid they just lost or the fluid they just lost. But 15% stays in the interstitial tissues. Now that tissue, that, that interstitial liquid will end up drained in the lymphatic circulation into the lymph, um, the, into the lymph nodes um, through the lymphatic vessels. Um, now we don't see this happening, but if you, if you think what happens when you block the venous return, and what happens when you apply a little bit more pressure on the veins and now um, the the lymph is not really um, accumulating at the same speed that it should happen because now you increase the hydrostatic pressure so every time you wear tight socks or a, a ring that is tight around your finger or, or, or something that increases the venous pressure and therefore the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries has increased. You see what happens to your skin. You see what happens to the interstitial fluid uh, that is uh, in your skin or in your tissues. It's also very evident when someone has uh, a heart condition and that heart condition disallows the venous return from um, returning at the same speed and uh, therefore you have a higher venous pressure which accumulates into higher hydrostatic pressure. That's why people with right side heart failure, we often see that they have um, edema in, in, in their limbs and particularly in the lower limbs. So the function again of the lymphatic system would be to recover all that liquid, all that fluid that is being dumped into the interstitial space from the capillaries. Now we all agree that 15% or so is not being absorbed back by the, the, uh, the, the capillaries, and I'm talking about the blood capillaries, because we have a different type we will learn about today, which is the lymphatic capillary. Um, that's the first function, so the, f the fluid recovery, we now talk about that. Now in terms of immunity, uh, the lymphatic system will pick up the foreign antigens, will pick up the foreign cells, the chemicals, the bacteria, even cancer cells sometimes, they drain along the lymph, the lymph into um, the lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes uh, will be really the site of activation. The immune cells will stand guard against foreign matters that just entered now the lymphatic circulation and will attempt to activate uh, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes in order for you to fight those uh, intruders, 
Uh, so as for immunity, as we studied and we will study um, in the next uh, lecture together, uh, the lymphatic system and the TMB lymphocytes are very, very important uh, in your um, immune system. Add to this the function of um, <coughs> the, the thymus gland as uh, the site of uh, determining uh, the immunocompetence and picking and choosing which T lymphocyte um, makes it through and which T lymphocyte has to be eliminated. Essentially, any T lymphocyte that fails to recognize uh, MHC, as we talked in the lecture, uh, will be eliminated. Any uh, T lymphocyte that recognizes your own uh, proteins, your own peptides, as antigens worth attacking, they will be also eliminated. So as for functions for the lymphatic system, it's enormous and people without thymus, if you remove the thymus in very early age, as we will see later today in the lecture, those people fail to have uh, any immunity, uh, T cell immunity. And uh, there is, as we talked about in the lecture, there is uh, one type of uh, transgenic mouse or a mouse that has uh, a problem. I don't think it's transgenic, but a mouse that has a problem in developing the thymus gland, and we call that a thymic mouse. And the thymic mouse has no T uh, lymphocyte immunity whatsoever. So it emphasizes the second function of the immunity uh, when it comes to the lymphatic system. Now the third part is lipid absorption, and you see that in the small intestine. We will find special lymphatic vessels. Those are called lacteals. Those will absorb the dietary lipids, and uh, that those lipids, unlike the small, um, um, the short fatty acids, uh, the, the bigger fatty acids and the larger lipids, these are not absorbed, they cannot enter the general circulation. So they will be absorbed instead by those lymphatic capillaries, and we will talk about that when we get to it. So once again, the function of the lymphatic system would be fluid recovery. For everything your um, your uh, blood capillaries dumped in the interstitial fluid. And you can definitely enhance that by applying more pressure on the, uh, on the venous circulation and therefore you are dumping more fluid because you increase the hydrostatic pressure. Um, the second function and really a very important function of the lymphatic system and we'll talk more details about it uh, which is the immunity. Uh, it shares in the immune response of your body to foreign intruders. The third function is your lipid absorption. All right? And we did talk about those three functions. Um, once again, to remind us, so the return of the interstitial fluid uh, that leaked uh, from the blood, it picks that up and dumps it to the plasma and uh, it, together with the lymphoid organs and tissues, it provides the structural base for the immune system. Now, what is lymph? What is it? Uh, it we will see that it's a, a clear, colorless fluid. Uh, it's very low on, on proteins when we compare it to the plasma. It's thinner. Um, but we'll find inside macrophages, hormones, everything that started to leak from your interstitial space can easily travel through the lymph. Imagine the lymph is like the sewer of your city. When the streets are washed by rain, everything will go to the sewer. And pretty much the same thing we have with the lymph when we wash our interstitial fluid with, uh, with, uh, with that uh, uh, oozing out from your capillaries, all that liquid will end up in the sewer, which is in our case, our, um, our lymphatic circulation. So even cancer uh, cells like to metastasize in uh, the lymph, and uh, that is why in the lymph vessels, and that is why 
um, we always refer to the metastatic ability of cancer by judging whether or not it has a lymph node association and we start to call the disease T1 and 2 uh, M0 and this kind of staging is really based on whether the cancer has metastasized and the N here refers to whether or not it has metastasized to lymph nodes so um, it provides a, again a good drainage system to the interstitial um, fluid and uh, whatever is contained in that interstitial fluid um, is um, will be carried in your uh, lymphatic vessels. That's why when we have uh, a fairly um, nasty infection, uh, you will start to, yes, see the lymph nodes, and we'll talk about the lymph nodes in a while, um, starting to be painful, but there will be also a, a line connecting the lymph nodes to the site of infection, and that line is usually more tender. Um, uh, that represents the lymphatic uh, uh, capillary path and the lymphatic vessel path that also got inflamed as uh, uh, as secondary to the primary site of infection. Um, again, this is how the lymph is formed. Um, the blood flow you have inside here, you have what we call the hydrostatic pressure you can increase the hydrostatic pressure by applying pressure here on the venous end and that will increase the hydrostatic pressure therefore you can increase um, the lymph or the interstitial not the lymph but the interstitial fluid um, on the other hand that interstitial fluid is supposed to be absorbed back at least 85 percent of it supposed to be absorbed back by what we call the osmotic pressure or the colloidal pressure of your capillaries blood capillaries and um, you can lose that if you have severe anemia so in case of severe anemia or you're losing too much proteins in your urine for example in, in, in nephritis uh, when you have inflammation of the kidney or autoimmune disease affecting the kidney now you're losing a lot of the proteins here and therefore this kind of pressure that draws back your fluids back to the blood flow is lost and therefore the person can have generalized edema everywhere on his body um, here we're looking at the structure of those capillaries What's really more most interesting in this slide is the fact that those those capillaries, those um, lymphatic capillaries, although they s are fairly similar to um, the endothelial uh, lining of your uh, blood capillaries, what you will see here is that they form incomplete junctions between each other and they form sort of flaps between those endothelial cells and this flap will allow the liquid to only go from outside inward but it wouldn't go back so it provides you with one-way direction uh, or for uh, the lymph to go in in what we call here uh, mini valves or flap like mini valves so th this is the striking part that I would like you to pay attention to uh, the lymphatic capillaries are here in this drawing and it draws to lymphatic vessels it will go through lymph, lymph nodes and we will see the art of going through the afferent and efferent uh, um, openings in the lymphatic nodes it collects into lymphatic duct lymphatic trunk and finally will open to your venous circulation where it will return to the heart and to be redistributed again so this is uh, the lymphatic circulation now you know that there is one more circulation you need to know um, not the blood circulation and not the cerebrospinal fluid circulation but now we need to understand also that there is something called lymphatic circulation now as I said the lymphatic vessels the capillaries will will allow for one-way system the lymph will flow towards the heart 
um, those vessels will include lymphatic capillaries as we saw in the previous picture, uh, lymphatic collecting vessels, and finally trunks and ducts. And capillaries, as you remember the picture, uh, they're very permeable, very leaky, and that's why they take lots of debris and pathogens, even cancer cells. Uh, the endothelial cells, as you saw in the picture, it makes an overlap and to form one-way mini-valves. Uh, but those mini-valves are anchored by collagen filaments, and that prevents the collapse of the capillaries when they are not full. And here is again the picture. Uh, here are the endothelial lining of those lymphatic capillaries and how they form this flap. And you can all appreciate the fact that those flaps are very permeable. Anything from the interstitial fluid here can easily go in and cancer cells don't have any problem uh, spreading through the lymph. Uh, of course some of the cancer cells are more aggressive and they will penetrate through the blood capillaries and spread through the blood but that's uh, that's not the, the, the most common types luckily because uh, that means they're highly highly aggressive uh, cancer cells most of the cancer cells they metastasize either locally or they would go through um, the lymphatic circulation as you can see here. The lymphatic capillaries will not find them any everywhere. We don't have lymphatic capillaries in the bone, in teeth, in bone marrow, and in the CNS and the, and the central nervous system. Um, so don't expect someone who has a uh, um, cancer or, or um, in, 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 uh, inside or infection rather inside the brain uh, cerebral abscess uh, to develop um, a lymph node inflammation in the neck for example you don't have that and um, so don't look for a sign of uh, brain abscess by palpating your uh, lymph nodes unless um, it involves the meninges unless it starts to involve the scalp but as long as it's inside the brain you wouldn't find uh, any lymph node involvement because simply there are no lymphatic capillaries there. Um, the lacteals, uh, we talked about that earlier, those are specialized lymph capillaries and they are present in uh, the intestinal mucosa and the idea that they absorb the digested fat not the very tiny fat, not, uh, not the, um, the short uh, chain fatty acids. Those can get in easily by binding through a protein carrier and they can get into the blood straight. But we're talking about the bigger fat molecules. Uh, they, um, the, the, the lymphatic capillaries, those lacteals, will carry that fat uh, into the blood and that's why uh, the consistency of lymph uh, in the intestinal portion of the lymphatic uh, circulation is milky and because of the presence of this high content of fat or what we call chyle in it. Um, if we compare the blood and the lymphatic uh, blood, uh, the lymphatic vessels we'll see that the lymphatic collecting vessels, they are similar, but they have thinner walls, and the anastomos more frequently mean they meet each other, and they connect with each other more frequently. Um, they're col the, the ones collecting um, in the vessels, uh, uh, the, the collecting vessels that are in the skin, will travel alongside with the super superficial veins. The deep ones, uh, they travel alongside with the arteries. Uh, the nutrients to those are supplied by branches from the arteries next door. <coughs> Here's a picture depicting a uh, part of our uh, lymphatic system and the lymphatic circulation. We can just appreciate from this picture uh, the capillaries, the vessels, and how do we have regional distribution of those lymph nodes. They're not everywhere, but you will see some here in the cubital area, some in the axillary. These are fairly important, especially for breast cancer patients. Um, some around the neck, around the jugular, or what we call cervical nodes here and submandibular nodes. These you will see very 
uh, evident when you have sinusitis or when you have nasty uh, infection uh, in around uh, the the nose and the mouth or you have your uh, sore throat um, uh, tonsillitis uh, you will start to see those uh, lymph nodes fairly enlarged then we also have of clinical importance we have those inguinal nodes again when you have infection uh, that is uh, draining into those lymph nodes uh, infection from the legs or or the thigh uh, or even the genital area uh, it will drain here and so you will see enlarged inguinal uh, lymph nodes um, when you are doing surgeries if you are doing um, surgery in uh, the abdomen uh, look for for cancer for example look for those lymph nodes and those are the lymph nodes you sample the same thing if you're doing a surgery here for lung cancer or esophageal cancer you're looking for those lymph nodes and you start to sample few of those to see whether or not cancer has actually metastasized there or not now we moved from the lymphatic capillaries to the lymphatic vessels to the lymphatic ducts uh, we have two major ducts uh, the right lymphatic duct and we have the thoracic duct uh, both of them will empty into the venous circulation at the junction of the internal jugular and the subclavian veins on on its own side so the right one will go to the right and the left will go to the left so here we have uh, the the picture of the right jugular trunk uh, here is the left subclavian trunk and here we have the thoracic the thoracic is only on your right side of uh, the vertebrae and uh, this is uh, uh, an enlargement in uh, the duct it starts w this is where the thoracic duct really starts and we call that cisterna chile that's where all the ducts from the intestine from uh, for the blood the vessels the lymphatic vessels from the intestine will empty there and that's where it takes the name uh, the chyle from or the chile from now, of course, as I said, things can go wrong with the lymphatic circulation. Uh, I believe this picture was taken from a patient uh, who had uh, some of uh, the inguinal uh, lymph nodes uh, removed, or she has um, probably uh, a tumor, an ovarian tumor, uh, on the right side, and that ovarian tumor is pushing on the venous circulation, and therefore you can see... Uh, this kind of uh, unilateral uh, edema uh, uh, of of um, um, the lower limb, and uh, it can be for any reason. Either you are reducing the absorption from the lymphatic circulation, or by applying pressure on the veins due to um, ovarian tumor or due to constriction of your. Uh, veins in this region uh, you will start to have higher hydrostatic pressure and therefore you can have uh, this kind of uh, edema now uh, worse than that uh, this is a, a situation called elephantiasis and it can be due to blocking of the lymphatic circulation uh, this blocking can happen due to many reasons um, in, in some countries there is a worm that causes this and the worms like to live in the lymphatic circulation and cause elephantiasis because all the lymph now accumulates in your tissues but has a very hard time uh, returning um, things like that can happen for more than a reason but not with this severity um, patients for example who undergo cancer treatment by surgery and they end up uh, removing uh, lots of um, the, the, the lymph uh, nodes as uh, part of breast uh, surgery for breast cancer uh, mastectomy um, they end up with some sort of edema also in the skin and in the upper limb but luckily the body sort of figures it out and, and manages it to some extent by redirecting uh, the lymph back to the blood um, it, it can also happen uh, for um, stripping uh, 
veins, uh, which is a treatment we do for varicose veins where you uh, remove the whole uh, superficial vein. And when you remove the superficial vein, of course, you're removing with it the superficial um, lymphatic capillaries and vessels, and therefore that person can suffer at least to uh, a period of time from increased edema. But these are things that can happen wrong and makes us appreciate the draining power of our lymphatic circulation. Now the transport, uh, we don't have a heart for the lymphatic blood, uh, for the lymphatic circulation, so the lymph will be propelled by pulsation from the arteries nearby or by the contraction of the muscles which act as what we call peripheral artery and those pumping power of the muscles when you contract and relax them will help pushing through the lymph uh, into the circulation but just remember it's a one-way uh, transport that goes from the interstitial fluid and from your intestine into the venous circulation. Now, uh, the lymph, uh, lymphatic system has uh, important uh, cell types, which we call the lymphocytes, and we studied in details when we were at the immune system. Um, the lymphocytes have uh, two main varieties, the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes, and some of you will also remember that the natural killer cells or NK cells are also part of it. We're not going to talk today about those cells. Those will be for the immune system, so we will um, we'll talk about them when we get to that lecture. Um, we know just briefly now the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes uh, protect against antigen and uh, we'll leave it at there because the lymphocytes is uh, much bigger to talk about uh, in, in this chapter and uh, we already sort of covered it in, in, uh, in our uh, immune system so I'm gonna skip through those slides. Um, other lymphoid cells and these now we need to talk about those we have macrophages. The macrophages will find them in the lymphoid tissues. What are the lymphoid tissues or the lymphatic tissues? Uh, we'll talk about those. Um, so like the lymph nodes, the spleen, uh, the thymus, um, and then we have the tonsils, and we have uh, mucosal associated lymphoid tissues, We'll talk or, uh, or malt. Uh, we'll talk about all these guys, but inside them we'll find cells like macrophages, the macrophages we all know from our blood chapter and from our immune chapter, it phagocytose foreign substances and help activating the T cells. How do they help activating the T cells? By the cytokines they, se they, they secrete, by uh, representing the antigens, remember those trophies we talked about in the lecture, and um, <coughs> when macrophages phagocytose something, they represent the antigen of the things they just phagocytosed on their back so the T lymphocytes will realize it and now you can activate those T lymphocytes uh, when it is uh, when those uh, peptides or uh, antigens are presented on MHC, type 2 MHC. Um, the dendritic cells will do the same function because they are uh, phagocytic cells. Uh, we have also reticular cells, but the reticular cells, these are produced as stroma that supports the other cells in the lymphoid organs. Here is a picture, and this is from a lymph node, and um, you will see here that we have reticular cells that give you the formation, the structure on which the macrophages can attach, the lymphocytes can wait patiently for the antigens to show up and then they get activated and uh, we will see those sinuses and how the blood actually, or not the, the blood but the lymph is circulating here in order to activate uh, those um, cells or get chewed up by your macrophages. Let's talk a little bit more about the lymphoid tissue. It will also house um, and provides a proliferation site for the lymphocytes. Uh, we did not talk about this yet, uh, which is part of the adaptive 
uh, immunity or the adaptive response, but we will cover that in great details, uh, the clone formation and, uh, uh, and uh, the formation of the memory cells, all that happens inside the lymphoid tissues. Uh, we will talk about them when we get into our second part of our immune system. Uh, so, but let's now appreciate the fact that the lymphoid tissue will house those sites that uh, will provide uh, the place where the proliferation of the lymphocytes, not the maturation, the maturation happens, as you remember, for the B lymphocytes, the maturation happens in the bone marrow, whereas the T lymphocytes, the maturation happens and the selection happens at the thymus. We will have two types of lymphoid tissues. One of them will be diffuse, that you can't say that this is a node or this is an organ. Um, it's throughout the tissue. You will find fossae of this kind of lymphatic tissue, or you will have some organs or tissues that you can call them out and say, well, these are lymphatic follicles, or uh, so it's, it's more or less localized. So we have two types. One is diffuse, and the other one will form follicle formation. Uh, the diffuse one uh, will be scattered the reticular tissue elements uh, in every body organ. You will see follic you will see patches of that lymphoid tissue. Uh, you will see quite a bit in uh, in what we call lamina propria of the mucous membranes and in the lymphoid organs. And we will see the structure of the lymphoid organs in a short bit. Now, the nodules, um, the lymphatic follicles, you will see them solid and the spherical and tightly packed reticular elements and cells. And let's, if we look now at the lymph nodes, we will realize that the lymph nodes are the principal lymphoid organ of your body. They are embedded in the connective tissues in clusters as you saw earlier we have inguinal we have axillary we have cubital we have cervical and they are near the body surface in the inguinal axillary and the cervical region but of course we have as as you saw earlier in the mediastinal for example um, they are uh, fairly deep so um, uh, some areas uh, of specific interest, as I showed you earlier um, in, in the, in the uh, map or in the drawing uh, depicting those um, uh, lymph nodes and uh, the, the distribution of those, the inguinal nodes, uh, they, they are in the groin and they receive the lymph from the entire lower limb. Um, the axillary lymph nodes, these are of particular importance uh, to cancer patients. For example, uh, they would uh, receive a lymph from the upper limb and from the breast. Uh, we have the cervical lymph nodes, and these uh, occur um, in two groups. They are superficial, and there is another one that is uh, deep in the neck, and they bring in the lymph or they monitor the lymph that is coming from the head and the neck. So you will find the lymph nodes are distributed in specific um, areas around, uh, around the body and uh, aggregation of those lymph nodes um, all over uh, your body in, s in certain areas as you see here in this, uh, in this picture. Um, if we talk about the lymph nodes now, the function of them will be to filter the lymph. As we talked earlier, that they contain lots of macrophages and the macrophages will destroy the macro microorganisms and uh, in other function of the immune system or the adaptive system, now you can activate lymphocytes, uh, B and T lymphocytes, and those can mount a specific attack against antigens. If we look at the structure of those lymph nodes, we'll realize that they are a bean shaped. Their size can vary. Some of them are small, uh, um, very fairly small, uh, like a, a pea uh, size or so. And um, some of them are large. It depends uh, on their uh, how much uh, recurrent uh, 
inflammation they have uh, underwent and whether or not they got enlarged or not. Uh, you see in the, uh, the thoracic or the mediastinal lymph nodes, for example, for the smokers, uh, they tend to have enlarged uh, nodes and it's fairly black because of all the carbon being uh, drained into the lymphatic uh, circulation and ending up in the lymph nodes. That's why the lymph nodes in the chest are black, uh, but it's not like their color is really black. At any event, so they are bean-shaped. They have external fibrous capsule. And we'll see in the next picture how the trabeculae, uh, those kind of shelves that are dividing it into compartments, um, they extend inward. And as I said, they will divide the node into compartments. We'll see that in the next picture. If we look under the microscope, we'll realize that we have two histologically distinct regions in the lymph node. One we will call the cortex, and the other one we will call the medulla. Uh, if I show just a picture here, uh, we'll realize that, for example, here is the cortex, um, and then the medulla would be um, the, the, the inside here. This part will be the medulla. And those are functionally and histologically different from each other uh, if we look at them under the microscope. So the cortex will contain follicles, and those follicles will have the B lymphocytes, and uh, it will have the dendritic cells uh, that nearly encapsulates the follicles. Um, it will contain uh, the deep cortex, will contain T lymphocytes that are intransient, and the T cells or the T lymphocytes, they circle continuously among the blood and uh, lymph nodes and the lymphatic stream and those of course can get activated because of the antigens now you are carrying in your um, uh, in your lymphatic in your lymph and the antigens that get represented on the back of the macrophages or the phagocytes uh, the T cells are capable of recognizing those ones that ended up on the back of the phagocytes and get activated as we will study in more details when we get to the immune system. Once again, here is the picture. What's interesting here is that there are many afferent um, uh, lymph vessels. As you can see, you're entering the lymph from multiple locations, but you're exiting at much less locations. And please also notice the presence of those kind of like valve-like structures, which ensures that um, the flow of the lymph goes only unidirectional. It goes from um, from one end to the um, the lymph and from the lymph out um, to the big collecting vessels and then to the ducts and to the, uh, the, the, the venous circulation, but it doesn't go the opposite way. So it's, it's a very important thing to notice about this. Uh, we will see in the medulla, which is this part here, we will see what we call medullary cord and we have medullary sinuses. The medullary cords, they extend inward uh, from the cortex and they contain the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes and the plasma cells which are actually activated B uh, cells. Uh, remember the B cells or the B lymphocytes, they are the ones who give rise to the plasma cells. Uh, now, the lymph sinuses will contain the macrophages. As you can see, uh, the structure helps you a lot in uh, defending yourself against intruders that will end up in your lymph drained as drained by your lymphatic circulation. Uh, this is an actual picture, not just a drawing. And we have the cortex and we'll have here the medulla. We have the medullary cords and the medullary sinusoids. And uh, in the cortex here, we will have the follicles. And these are the trabeculae. These are the septa that divides into compartments or compartmentalize your lymph node. Uh, the lymph will enter um, into the lymph node by several afferent, as we saw in our uh, two pictures ago. And uh, it will travel through the this sub 
capsular sinuses and smaller sinuses and it will be sort of filtered and from even from one node to the other just because it passed one node it doesn't mean game is over that lymph will be carried to the next node so you have more than one line of defense when it comes to the lymph nodes to defend your body against intrusion it will exit uh, the node from the hilus via the efferent vessels and we will see as we talked about earlier that there is fewer efferent uh, than afferent and that allows the flow uh, to slow down and allows more interaction time between the lymphocyte macrophages with the intruders that came um, through your lymph. That was the lymph node, and that was really the major um, component of our, the lymph our lymphatic system, but that's not the only one. Uh, in addition to that, we have the spleen. Um, the spleen is the largest lymphoid organ. Um, it receives uh, blood supply by what we call splenic artery and vein. Uh, it functions as the site of uh, lymphocyte proliferation, just like we had with... Um, with the lymph nodes and immune surveillance and response, um, it cleanses the body from the blood. Uh, it cleanses the blood from the aged uh, red blood cells and the platelets and debris. They get trapped there, and that's the graveyard for uh, the aging uh, red blood cells. Um, so, of course, it makes sense to have lots and lots of macrophages there to eat all those cells that will end up. Um, dead in your um, in your spleen. It doesn't mean we can't live without the spleen. And in many accidents, um, people can end up with ruptured spleen. And in many cases, also people they undergo splenectomy, where the whole spleen is removed due to one reason or the other. Um, they may have lesser of immune response. Uh, they may have uh, a problem with uh, filtering the dead um, red blood cells or the aging red blood cells, but they will survive. It's not like they will not live. Here's a picture of the actual spleen, and the spleen is on, on of course, on the left side of your body uh, towards the back, all the way almost underneath your ribs, and it circles around uh, your side. I'll show you that when we get to the lab, the exact location and the size of the spleen. Um, the spleen would, uh, would store the breakdown products of the red blood cells, it would store the blood platelets. Uh, when we are still uh, embryos, it's a site of uh, erythrocyte production, red blood cells. Uh, production and that doesn't continue after we are born it shifts to the bone marrow at that point it has uh, fibrous capsule and trabeculae it contains just like we saw with the lymph nodes it contains the lymphocytes macrophages and huge number of erythrocytes uh, if we look at the structure deeper we'll find that it has two distinct areas a white pulp and we have the red pulp uh, the white pulp will contain mostly lymphocytes and the red pulp will be rich in macrophages and the worn out red blood cells and also blood-borne pathogens. So if we look here, uh, we will realize the structure a little more of the spleen if we uh, take uh, a section in it. And this is the white pulp and this would be the red pulp. Okay, the red pulp is here, and the white pulp would be over there. That is the capsule. I mentioned it wrong as the white pulp. That's my fault. Now to a very important organ, important in terms of immunity, and we did cover it more or less when we uh, talked about the immune system, uh, the thymus. It's behind your sternum. And uh, in, in infants, it will be in the inferior neck, and uh, when we are, uh, when we grow up, it becomes uh, hidden sort of behind your sternum um, or in the mediastinum. Um, the thymus, if you remember, was the site of maturation of T lymphocytes. 
the site of selection for the T-lymphocytes. That is where you make your positive and negative selection for your T-lymphocytes as we talked about. Uh, and so we're not going to cover much of the maturation of the T-lymphocytes here. Uh, once again, we will leave that into um, the immune system, but I want you to appreciate um, what happens at the thymus and why is it uh, important for us. So in infants, as I said earlier, it's found in the inferior neck and it extends to the mediastinum where it partial, partially overlies the heart, increases its size, and it's most active during childhood because this is the time when you are selecting and making all kinds of different uh, T-lymphocytes uh, that will stay and will make your memory um, uh, cells in your body that will be uh, your clones for later on. Uh, that will help you defend your body uh, throughout your life. That is why you really need to be exposed to some sort of antigens when you are a kid and overprotecting the kids uh, is not a very good idea when everything has to be wiped with bleach, when everything has to be wiped with Lysol and you don't allow any interaction uh, with uh, bacteria, not necessarily harmful bacteria, but how else would you build uh, your immunity, especially taking in consideration that the thymus is most active when you are a child. Um, uh, when will you build that immunity when you are older, when your thymus is not as capable of producing immunity? So it's a question I would like to throw uh, your way when we are talking about the thymus and the immunity. Gradually in older age it will atrophy and that is why, of course, in older age, we don't develop a uh, new uh, immunity towards um, uh, pathogens that we are unfamiliar with or we don't have um, memory against. Uh, the thymus will have uh, um, lobes, the structure of it, that also will divide it into outer cortex and inner medulla. Uh, the cortex will have the lymphocytes again and scattered macrophages. The medulla will have fewer lymphocytes, but it will also be encapsulated in a way, uh, or, uh, and no, it, it will be, um, the medulla will also contain um, what we call regulatory T. Remember, the regulatory T are the one uh, helping in the maturation of the B lymphocytes and we will talk about the B lymph or the selection of the B lymphocytes. Uh, we will talk about the, that kind of, uh, of uh, clo clone uh, formation and um, the, 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 the uh, uh, activation of B lymphocytes by the regulatory T lymphocytes when we get to the immune system. Here is the thymus where it is, and we sort of took uh, a transverse section here, but this is the anatomical location of the thymus behind your sternum in the mediastinum. Now the thymus will differ from the lymphoid organs in important ways. It is strictly to activate the T lymphocytes. Uh, it doesn't really fight against antigens, but it's very, very important uh, for the maturation and the negative and positive selection for the T lymphocytes, which we studied um, in the immune system. I do have a picture here I added to this lecture just to remind you of what exactly happens when we do the negative and positive selection of the T lymphocytes and the thymus. Um, over here is the picture I wanted to remind you. As you will see, you have uh, what we call thymocytes. We will have uh, dendritic cells. Those are antigen-presenting cells. And we will have uh, lymphocytes. Um, uh, these are macrophages over here. And um, that will allow for antigen interaction. And if you remember our story, how the T lymphocytes that left your... Um, your uh, bone marrow will come here into, it's almost like a police academy where they will be trained and only 2% or so will make it through the thymus. They will get really beaten up in the thymus uh, to uh, remove every cell that will interact with your own antigens and will also remove any cell that does not, that fails to recognize MHC 
major histocompatibility complex um, two. Now another lymphoid tissue we did cover so far, the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the thymus, uh, the tonsils, uh, which are very commonly inflamed, and the reason for that, it's lying in a very um, uh, uh, vulnerable place uh, right in your, um, in your, in your pharynx. Um, and uh, even the, it's not even completely encapsulated. So of course organisms can find their way uh, and uh, and cause inflammation. So tonsillitis is is a very uh, common thing, especially in childhood. But it's really for the benefit. It, it it's made this way so you will have an interna interaction uh, with those um, pathogens. And uh, now that will provide your body with immunity against uh, those because they will uh, end up activating uh, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. And uh, th that's why uh, it's a really a, 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 an unfortunate thing when the tonsils are removed at uh, a young age because um, you would lose this kind of interaction between your lymphoid system and uh, the outside world. Uh, but of course, uh, you, if it has a repeated or chronic infection that you cannot control by antibodies, then um, it is the only way to treat that situation is to remove uh, the tonsils or they become so enlarged and um, they block the respiration, so you risk also having uh, a problem with um, the breathing of uh, that child. Uh, if we look at the structure of the tonsils, we will find that we have uh, the palatine tonsils. These are associated with the palate. And lingual tonsils uh, at the base of the tongue. We have pharyngeal tonsils in the posterior wall of the nasopharynx and uh, the tubal tonsils. Um, they are um, surrounding the opening of the auditory tubes into the pharynx. Uh, the tonsils will contain follicles in germinal cells. They are not fully encapsulated, so it's very easy, of course, to get infection, but it's for a purpose. Remember, this is how you build your immunity. Um, the epithelial tissue uh, overlying the tonsils uh, will invaginate making forming what we call tonsillar crypts and that will allow the bacteria to sit in those crypts and get uh, acted upon by your macrophages and by your lymphocytes. Here is uh, those crypts I was uh, telling you about and those are of course very good site for the bacteria that's passing through your mouth uh, in swallowing or breathing um, like here, uh, it would uh, be trapped in those crypts and therefore your lymphocytes uh, or macrophages first will start attacking it and now you're building immunity, um, uh, whether it's humoral or cell-mediated uh, immunity against those intruders and imagine what happens when you don't have that kind of interaction, when you don't have that kind of uh, teaching to your system that this bacteria actually exists in life um, uh, it's a, like I said earlier, it's a very unfortunate thing when uh, we remove the tonsil, for example, at one year old or two years old, uh, babies uh, or kids, uh, because uh, they don't get a chance to be educated about those um, bacteria. So we did cover um, the lymph nodes, we did cover the, the, the spleen, and we talked uh, about the thymus and the tonsils. Now we have aggregates of uh, lymphoid follicles and we'll, we'll find that in the small intestine, for example, in what we call pear patches. And uh, we have pear patches uh, near the appendix um, and that's again, another reason why we have the appendix. It's a very uh, interesting place to build your immunity because it gives you a crypt where bacteria can settle and they can get destroyed and uh, again it builds your immunity and generates your memory lymphocytes but of course again uh, the appendix is a place where infection can 
uh, be uncontrolled and uh, it's a good place just like the tonsils it's a good place to build your immunity but it's also a good place for the bacteria uh, to be invited to and if the bacteria exceeds the ability of your immune system to fight it over then you have a situation like we had with the appendicitis or the, 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 the tonsillitis you can have appendicitis which is uh, an inflammation of or infection of the appendix appendix uh, finally, uh, malt, uh, that's uh, mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, and uh, they include the payers patch we ta patches we talked about, but they also include lymphoid nodules you will find in the bronchi, and they would help protecting the digestive and the respiratory system from uh, foreign matters. Again, remember those, you want the lymphocytes or you want the lymphoid tissue to be around areas where bacteria is most likely to come. And in this way, you want to train uh, your uh, lymphocytes that's sitting there patiently waiting for their antigen uh, to be displayed to them. And therefore, you are activating them. And therefore, you develop immediate and uh, long-term uh, immune effect, what we call the memory immunity. And we will talk about that when we cover the immune system in details. Uh, when we are um, when we are five, year, five weeks uh, old or so, uh, the lymph nodes will start appearing and the lymphatic vessels will start appearing. Um, the lymphatic organs, uh, all of them except the thymus, will come from the mesoderm. Um, the thymus will um, form an outgrowth of the pharynx and um, except for the spleen and tonsils uh, the lymphoid organs are poorly developed at birth uh, but of course the spleen and the tonsils they are fully developed um, and that's very important as I said earlier the tonsils are very important for um, helping your immune system and uh, generating your um, uh, memory immunity and uh, immediate also both humoral and cell-mediated immunity as we will discuss uh, in 